about 10 years ago, I had this major uh, hernia-related surgery. I was, prior to that, I was I had all these problems, hernia problems. I was in constant pain. And all hopped up on Vicodin. Have you ever been hopped? Are you hopped up on Vicodin now? Uh, no. <laughs> all hopped up on Vicodin. I was a mess. Um, despite my being in a tremendous amount of pain and then on narcotics, I was still pastoring and leading this church. Probably not very well, but uh, I probably preached some of my best sermons during that time and probably some of my worst. So maybe you got to witness some of those. Um, but yeah, it was, a, it was a very difficult and even dark season that, that I kind of, you know, it was hard. I kind of, in, in ways, I felt like I was walking it alone, although I had the support of some of you and some family. But it really felt like I was, you know, and, you know, you get inside your head at times. I felt like I was alone when in reality I wasn't. And so I had this major surgery, um, came out okay, thanks to the Lord and UCLA. And. My doctor's like, all right, it's therapy time. You got to do physical. Th- you're not done yet. Right. Like, I just gutted you and put you back together, but you're not done yet. You, you got you to gotta do physical therapy. And, and because it's all lower half, because you're in so much pain, uh, the best physical therapy is pool time. So you just need to get into the pool and you need to start walking in the pool and then eventually start swimming. And so I did this, and I don't know if you can tell, but I don't exactly have a swimmer's bod. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm not like one of those long, lanky water polo guys. Um, so I kind of like, uh, like a rock, I just sink down to the ground, and it just, not my thing. But, you know, I was just, <sighs> all right, if you're new, we're one of these, you know, charismatic churches that believes in miracles, signs, and wonders. I'm all in. That's what I live for. That's why I do this. Um, But God didn't heal me, which sucks, right? Have you ever prayed for physical healing and not been healed? Like, it's a bummer. Like, it works on your, it works on your faith. Uh, it, It works on your relationship with God. It's a tough one. And, well, God didn't heal me on this one. I've been healed miraculously several times before. I have an incredible history with God in signs and wonders and miracles. Incredible. I couldn't ask for more. But for some reason, I had to go through the process of the rehabilitation. I had to go through the therapy process of getting in that pool every day, whether I liked it or not, whether it was you know, cold outside or hot outside. Every day I had to get into that pool and I had to start walking just to put my lower half back together. And then eventually I started swimming. And the strange thing is, I fell in love with the pool. I fell in love with swimming. I swim every week now. And again, I didn't know how to do it. I still don't really know how to swim well. Um... I've had one swimming um, lesson my entire life, and everything else is just self-taught. I, I, watch, I watch the other swimmers, and I, I watch how they do it, and then I try to mimic what they do, and like YouTube is amazing. Like I've learned so much. There's like YouTube teachers that, that will teach you how to swim, and so this is, I, this is one of the things that I do um, for exercise, but I love to do it. And you've heard me say before, I have a prayer box, it's at the gym, it's the sauna, it's the hot box, I sweat it out, and I pray, and I feel sorry for the suckers that come into the, into the sauna when I'm, in, when I'm praying in there. It's always like, what do, you, what, what do you do for a living? And then, it's ministry time, and you're stuck in the box with Pastor, Pastor Josh, and um, <laughs> naked guys talking about Jesus, you know? That didn't sound really good at all, did it? I should not. Nope, nope. Nope, nope. Oh, it's going to be one of those Sundays, everybody. I'm sorry. 
And so the pool has also become a spiritual tool for me. Because I get in, and I start lapping, and I start doing scripture in my head while I'm lapping. Guys, if you're having a hard time praying, guys, if you're having a hard time reading the Bible and memorizing the Word of God, like if you can't sit still, if you're one of those hyperactive kids, raise your hand if you were a hyperactive boy in elementary school. I got a few. This is what you do. You stack your discipleship time with something that you like to do. Like you don't have to like get in your desk, open your Bible, and then just force, sometimes you do, and force yourself to study. Like get your body moving. Prayer walk, prayer run, prayer ride. I ride my bike too. That's another thing I do spiritually, believe it or not. And so, like, I fell in love with it. I get in the pool, and I begin to pray, and I begin to recite Scripture. And the pool has, most Olympic pools have, like, a cross at the end of it. And so it's, like a, it's a very specific focal point for me. And it's, just very, it's very meditative for me. And I can swim pretty decent right now. Like, before, it was just, like, this slow, painful walk. But now I've got really, I think I have decent form. My form is a lot better, and I'm a heck of a lot faster. And I'm learning how to swim in different ways. It's good for me. I like getting in that Olympic pool. I like immersing myself in the water. I know it sounds strange, but do you guys know that you need to repent like almost daily? Do you guys know that you need to, like, ask for forgiveness? Like, you know, probably hourly, honestly. Like, you need to, you, we need to do business with God, and you need to allow yourself to, to be washed clean. That's the whole purpose of baptism. And so every time I get in the pool, I just baptize myself. I do a little business with God, and I jump in the water. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a tool. Find your tool. Find your tool for connecting with God. So yesterday... I'm doing my thing, probably not very well, but I'm doing my swimming thing, and I get out, and I'm watching the swimmers. The gym has the, the pool lanes shortened. Sometimes they put the lanes um, short to go this way, and sometimes they make the lanes like super long like Olympics, and they were shortened. So there's about, about 12 lanes open and about six people in the pool. And then a sister was watching them. I'm like, they're all swimming differently. They're all swimming differently. I was so captivated by watching all of these people swim that I went back into the locker room, and I got my phone, and I recorded them, which is probably not a good thing to do. You know what's even worse than recording them? It's showing you. So, here we go. Let's bring the lights down low, Luke. And it's only nine seconds. There are no faces. Gosh, I hope I don't get in trouble for this. Don't tell. Do not tell. Like, and I don't encourage anybody to do this, but it's for the Lord, right? It's for the Lord. All right, are we able to show it? Lights down low. You don't have it. Oh. Oh, we don't have it? All right. God said no. All right. I, God said no, and my wife said no, so. Looks like I'm just going to have to demonstrate what I saw. Okay, so initially what caught my eye, you know, there's, you know, just people swimming, but what, what initially caught my eye so there's this gal, and she was doing the synchronized swim dancing thing. And I just noticed like these big giant legs going like this in the, in the water, and then she pops up her head, and she's got the skull cap on, and then she's doing this kind of stuff. I'm like, what in the world? I'm serious. I'm not exaggerating. It was the funniest thing. And I, I just completely got captivated by her, her swim dancing. She was just doing all of this really weird motion stuff. And then the legs, like these big giant legs going like this. 
And I'm like, so initially, you just kind of have to chuckle a little bit. And then you're like, wait a minute, she's in seven feet water. Like she's dancing while she's treading. And it just hypnotized me. And then as, so as she's doing this, there's this triathlete who has, I was just as mesmerized by him because he had complete perfect form and he was a, he was a freaking missile in the water, just boom, 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 back and forth, back and forth, perfect form. And I know the guy, he is a full-blown triathlete. So not only, this is just play, this is just, you know, the way he's doing in the Olympic pool is nothing because he's going to hit the ocean. He's going to swim in open water. It's cool. And then there was an old guy who also had perfect form, but he was old, and he had flippers, and he was cranking, definitely doing better than I did, back and forth with his little flippers. And then there was another gal who had a mask on and then a snorkel, and she was kind of cruising, kind of taking her time. And then there was the other guy. who was in there for therapy, <laughs> just like me. I could tell. I could tell by looking at him. He was just like moving super slow. He, you know, his, he definitely did not have the triathlete body or the, you know, the synchronized swimmer body. Like his body was hurting, but he was doing laps back and forth and back and forth. And so... You want to know why I think the Lord brought this to my attention? It's because believers all swim differently, and we need to be okay with it. That's right. Amen. Because it's not, a, it's not that you have the perfect stroke. It's not that you're dancing in the water. It's not that you know, you've got your tools, you've got your flippers and your snorkel, and you've got all this gear. That's not what's really important. What's really important is that you're in the Olympic pool, that you're, that you're actually swimming in the, in the Olympic pool. You're actually doing this stuff, and the Lord doesn't care how, you, how, you, how well you do it or if you do it improperly. What he really, really cares about is if you're doing it. Because at the same time that there was half a dozen people working out in their own particular way, I don't know how, how else to say this. <sighs> I'm not going to do it. I can't. I'll get in trouble. <laughs> you just talk to me later. I'll tell you what's in my, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what's in my head. It's filtering, self-filtering. So while there are these people that are working out in the Olympic pool, there are more people in the jacuzzi relaxing, running their mouth, being completely okay of being out of shape and overweight. So you can probably figure out what word I wanted to call them. Somebody knows. You got me. I have literally have seen guys go from the locker room in their swimming Speedos with their goggles. They go from the locker room straight to the jacuzzi to just sit there and run their mouths and they don't even get into the Olympic pool. Do you see the illustration, my friends? Do you, do you, do you see the hypocrisy in that from putting on a racing swimsuit and just getting in the jacuzzi? Do you, okay, do you, hopefully you see this. The Lord wants us, in, he wants us in, the, in the Olympic pool. He wants us competing. He wants us swimming. Don't go straight to the jacuzzi. You can do the jacuzzi after you've burned yourself out. But don't go straight to the jacuzzi. Get in the water, whether you like it or not, and go deep. And in and and, and the way that God's created you. So if you're a dancer, dance. If you're, if you're going to power through, if you're going to be all aggro, go aggro. Like hit it hard. If you just need a cruise, hey, at least you're cruising. At least you're moving. Just get in there and start moving. The same applies to your spiritual walk. 
And, and this, we, we, we can't trick ourselves thinking that we're being spiritual just because we've got our outfit on and we're sitting in water in the jacuzzi where it's nice and warm and comfortable. You've got to get in the water and start working out. Spiritually, that is. And so when I first started doing this, they, they switched the lanes from being short lanes to the long lanes like you would see you know, in the Olympics. And so I am, I am broken, physically broken. And I'm in the water, just struggling along, and then I'm kind of like doing like the, the, the and I, had, I don't know how to swim, but I'm swimming. I'm like dog paddling. I'm just like, oh, gosh, this hurts. I'm just like dog paddling, just trying to get across the, you know, 100 meters of water. And aggro boy, he just blows by me. He's like, dude, get in a different lane. Okay, so I, not only was I new to swimming, I don't know the pool rules. There are pool rules. And then, because all of the lanes were full. And so, when you only have a few lanes to go in, you have to uh, like do a little tiny loop inside of a lane. It's this pool etiquette. I had no clue about what pool etiquette was like. I didn't know that I, was, that I couldn't just like you know, flounder down the middle of the lane, just being pitiful, because there's guys there to work out, and I'm literally getting in their way. And so I, got to, I needed to pull over to the side and do the loop like everybody else, and then that way they could go, on your left, and they could pass me, and it would be okay. But no, I, had, I was completely clueless. But I learned. I learned how to be in the lane. I learned how to do it the right way when all the lanes are full. And that's what we're going to talk about today in, from the book of Acts. So you understand the, the, the illustration that we all need to be in the pool and swimming. But did you know that there's times when there's only a few lanes and you need to know what lane you're in? You, you need to be in the lane, but you need to know how to function in the lane. Okay, we ready for this? With other swimmers, with other people. Now, the good news about where we are spiritually is that there are a lot of lanes open. There's, there's, the, there's 12 lanes, and there's only six people working out right now in the church, spiritually, metaphorically speaking. So there's, a lot of, there's, there's plenty of lanes for you to jump in and get going. But there will come a day when the Spirit of God moves upon all flesh, and it's gonna, the swimming lanes will be tight. And you just might step on another believer's toes. You just might be a little frustrated about how another believer is swimming. You just might be annoyed about how another Christian is worshiping. What do you think about that? You, you, you might feel that, that maybe... You can do a specific ministry or an outreach better than another person. And so we need to figure out how to swim together. And then this story in the book of Acts, specifically of the story of Barnabas. Of Barnabas and Paul will show us. I don't actually know if it's going to show us anything, but we can delve in. We can, we, can, we, can, we can look at it. We can look at the situation. One of the beautiful things about the book of Acts is that it is Holy Scripture, but it's so real. It's real-life stories. It's real-life people with real emotions and real habits and real hang-ups. They're, I mean, you see... In the book of Acts, you see people sacrificing everything, and then you see people acting like idiots. It's just like us. Right. Amen. Amen. So get your book of Acts. We'll start off. Chapter 15, and we'll go to verse 36. Chapter 15, verse 36. Now, um, if you're following along in the home groups and the Bible studies on Wednesdays, uh, this is where we're at. So we're, we're, going, we're going 
verse by verse, book by book, in small groups, and then in here on Sunday. So that's, that's what we're doing. We're understanding the entire book of the book of Acts. So Barnabas was introduced last week, and he was there when the church was birthed. Everybody was in this, the holy city of Jerusalem, and Jesus had left the planet, and the Holy Spirit gets poured out upon the church, and the church is birthed. And then we see the, the acts or the revelation and the movement of the Holy Spirit begin to take place and to empower God's people to literally change the world. And exponentially, people were coming to the faith of Jesus Christ, like overnight, 1,000, 3,000, 5,000. It was, it, was, it was wildfire. And then they kill Stephen. Persecution happens. It's like something hit the church, and it scattered the church. But if you're following along, you will know that that hitting and that scattering was a good thing. The persecution actually aided the growth of the church. For what the devil wanted to use for, for ill, God turned it around and made it a blessing to the entire world. So persecution was actually, I mean, it sounds so bizarre, but it was a good thing for the church. It got it outside of the, the holy city and into the world. And one of, the, one of the engines, one of the catalysts to this movement was one man named Barnabas. His original name was Joseph, but they gave him a nickname, which was Barnabas, the son of encouragement. Bar means son. So the, the son of encouragement, the son of um, uh, even encouragement slash prophecy, meaning so, so the, gift of, the spiritual gift of prophecy is to do what? Anybody know? It's to tell you what, when the end of the world is so that you can uh, play the stock market right or maybe you can send a little bit longer. So is that the purpose of prophecy? No. What's the purpose of prophecy? to encourage the church. And Barnabas had this gift. So he is, he is the son of prophetic encouragement. Wow. And we need one of those these days, by the way. He is the son of prophetic encouragement. He comes in and the, encourages the church. The scriptures, I don't have time to read them all, but you can read them all when you get into it. But the scriptures define Barnabas as a good man. In contrast, comparison to being a righteous man. Uh, Saul, before he became Paul, before his conversion, Saul, ready for this? Saul was a righteous man. He knew the Bible inside and out, word for word. He was the Jew of all Jews. He, he, was, he had the law down. He knew exactly how you should live. Paul, excuse me, Saul was a the most righteous man on the planet at the time. The only problem was that he was righteous, but he just wasn't good. He had the rules, but he was not a good guy. He was not likable. He was not kind. He was, he was curt, short, and, and just, a, just downright murderer for, for righteousness' sake. How long are you going to make Pastor Josh dance? <laughs> All right. <laughs> if, if your phone goes off, I'm not going to dance again. I know some of you will be like, let's get Pastor Josh to dance again. Mm -mm. That's it. No, I'm not going to do it anymore. I have like no rhythm. All right, um, Barnabas was a good and righteous man. He was kind. He was generous. Like he saw the movement that was taking place in the early church, and he sold his property in Cyprus to fundraise, to finance it. One man paid for a movement that changed the world. And not only was he the sugar daddy, but well, Barnabas got in the pool. Like, he got in the pool and was swimming. And so, that's, so he, he comes in and he practically encourages the church in huge ways. 
And he allows this thing in this very special incubator in the very beginning to take place. And it is and after that after that incubation process, when 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 persecution scattered the church, everybody was good to go. They were all discipled. They were all tuned up. They they all began to spread the good news. And so uh, this good man had the discernment to understand what needed to take place, and this good man understood who to invest his time into. Not just to invest his money, but who to invest his time into. And we see him taking on his nephew, uh, John Mark, and he begins to disciple John Mark, and then he goes, he hears of Paul, he hears of this great conversion on the road to Emmaus. He's fascinated by the story because, because Paul has a reputation for abusing the church, for being a bad, righteous man. But Barnabas has a mission to love this crusty person. Amen. And he goes to Tarsus, and then he begins to minister to Paul. And then he takes them to Antioch, and then they spend 10 years together ministering to this community. And not only do they do that, they begin to travel. They begin to evangelize. They go to Cyprus. They go to Antioch. They go all over the place, and they begin to give the good news to the Gentiles, to those that haven't heard it yet. And it's, it's, a, it's one of the most amazing partnerships in the Bible, the partnership of Barnabas and Paul. It's an amazing partnership. They do a lot of good work. I actually think that if it wasn't for Barnabas, we we might not be sitting here. Not only in his contribution, but in the way that he spread the gospel with Paul. There's a very good chance that we we might not be sitting here, and then the, the the turn that they made to go into the Western world, it's just it's mind boggling, like like Barnabas taking Paul into the Western world literally not only changed Christianity but changed the Western world altogether. It, it, we can't quite understand how important that relationship was. Now, they go on a missionary trip, and then they're doing what all good disciples do. They're bringing other disciples in around them, and they go into this. And it's not easy. I mean, they're doing great stuff, but it's not easy. Like, they're getting beat up all the time. They're getting stoned all the time. Like, they're getting, they're getting cussed out all the time. So spreading the good news is not an easy task. There, it's, it's, there's a lot of pressure there. And so they, they take some young guys out on a mission trip, Barnabas and Paul, and things get heated. Things get awkward. Like, there's some social pressure. Like, there's some rocks that are being handled. Like, it's kind of intense. And Barnabas' nephew gets a little yellow, and he takes off, and he pieces out. He's like, I didn't sign up for this. I signed it up for, like, you know, preaching the word of God, signs, miracles, and wonders. I didn't sign up to get rocks thrown at me. And so this young man sneaks off and leaves the mission field. Barnabas' nephew. And then this is what happens. Verse 36. After some days, Paul said to Barnabas... Let us return and visit the brothers in every city that we proclaim the word of God and to see how they are. Now Barnabas, being the encourager that he is, now Barnabas wanted to take with him John Mark. John called Mark. Barnabas wanted to bring his nephew to give his nephew a second chance. Do you know why? Because Barnabas is an encourager. He's going to give his nephew, his, his uh, chicken nephew, a second chance. Yeah. 
But Paul thought it best not to take with them the one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to do the work. So Paul's like, why would we want to bring that guy? He didn't do any work. Like he couldn't lift up a hammer. And then when things got, when the going got tough, he got going. I don't want to work with that guy. I don't, I, don't want to, I don't want to be around him. I don't want to work with him. Like, so Barnabas and Paul, they get into, ready for this? It's hard to believe. They get into a disagreement. They don't see eye to eye. And they are both, they're both apostles. They, the, the scriptures call Barnabas an apostle too. So they, they're both like up there and they, they don't agree on what they should do. And there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. And Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed, having him uh, been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And so he went through Syria, Sicilia, uh, strengthening the churches. And so we see this is like, what's going on here? Why are they, why are they? So they got into a fight. Have you ever known a Christian and another Christian that got into a fight? My habit, because we're perfect. Right. Have you ever seen a disagreement between a brother and a sister, or a brother and brother, or a sister and sister in Christ? Have you ever seen a disagreement? How did it go? What's interesting, okay, we don't know the details. When we get to heaven, we can ask more if we want some juicy details. But I know human nature. And if you're married, you know that the problem, the disagreement, the problem is not always the problem. Like, arguing about who does the dishes is not the problem. That's where all the emphasis is, and that's where all the power and all the energy is going. So you're fighting over about who, do, who's do, who does the dishes. But that's not the issue, is it? There's another issue. There's a deeper underlying issue going on. And this is, this is speculation on my part. And I'm not, look, I, I'm, this is my interpretation of it because we don't have a specific interpretation of it. But I think that there is more going on than Paul and Barnabas fighting about whether they should bring this loser kid on this missions trip. I think there's something else going on. Paul and Barnabas swim at different paces. And the lanes are getting narrow. Paul has been in the pool for a very long time in a recovery process. He literally got in the pool so that the scales would fall off of his eyes when he was baptized. And he has been in therapy for a very long time. And now he's stepping into how God has designed him to be a full blown triathlete animal in the pool. He's got a drive that God created him with that was like no other. He had a steel trap of a mind that was the best legal mind on the planet at the time, and God needed to use him. And right before this big blow up, right before they have this argument over, again, some teenage kid that was being, you know, was slacking off, right before this moment, Paul preaches his very first sermon. And in the book of Acts, interestingly enough, up to this point, when it's referring to the dynamic duel of Barnabas and Paul, it, it's written exactly like that. Barnabas gets first billing. Meaning that when they name the dynamic duo, it's Batman and Robin. It's Barnabas and and Paul. Do you see where I'm going? And now, it's after this really amazing sermon that he gives for the very first time, his very first sermon, now it's changed, it's flipped to Robin and Batman. And I really think that that's what's going on. I think that, I'm not, again, we don't know how Barnabas is feeling. We don't know if he's jealous that, that, that Paul hit it out of the park. 
Uh, we don't know if he's insecure because now people, instead of saying Barnabas and Paul, they're now saying Paul and Barnabas. Like, we don't know exactly what's going on. But we just know that human nature, there's something going on. So intense that these people, these, these two guys that have been doing ministry 15 years, they have to separate. Have you ever had to work with somebody and you had to part ways? Because if you didn't part ways, like somebody was going to (laughs) die. Or some words were going to be said. And so you just choose to separate and go on different paths. The reason why this is a very human book and it's not just, it's not, it's giving us the word of God, but it's also showing us who we are. Now, Paul and Barnabas decide to go separate ways. Uh, we begin to see all the amazing things that Paul is going to continue to do, and we don't hear about Barnabas anymore. And I'm not saying he didn't do amazing things, but uh, um, Luke also went with Paul. And Luke's the guy that wrote the story. And the guy that writes the story writes all the good stuff about, the, about who he's with. And so Barnabas doesn't have a Luke to write down the story. So we have no idea what Barnabas did, how he conti- and I'm going to believe by faith that he continues to encourage the church because you just see his heart. He does not do a single negative bad thing in his, in his entire story in the New Testament where Paul does a lot of naughty things. And so I'm just believing by faith that Barnabas continues to do the good work of continuing to to be this this son of prophetic encouragement for the church. All right, so they go in two separate ways. Here's the big question that you need to talk through in your small groups if you're in one. The big question is, was this God's will? Was this God's will that they divided and were disunified? Is this God's will that they got into an argument that they could not reconcile? Or is this like another type of a a scattering, like like the persecution, where these two needed to be separated to go on separate paths to fulfill God's purpose? Okay, so was the the fight, was the pressure, was the drama... uh, Was that intended for them to separate? Was God doing that pressure to send them out? Or did the devil win the game? Okay, guess what? There is no answer. Because we don't know. It doesn't tell us. You read it with me. It clearly does not say that the Holy Spirit told them to separate. It doesn't say that. It says they got in a fight and they separated. So... We don't know if, if, if this was the Holy Spirit's idea or not. Uh, in chapter 16, we see clearly where the Holy Spirit says to Paul and Silas, um, you need to go left and not right. Now, wait, what's, what, what's that? that's not a big deal. The, the Holy Spirit tells Paul, you need to go to the west and not the east. Big deal, Josh. And that's a huge historical deal. If Paul would have been disobedient to the Holy Spirit, if he would have went right instead of the left. By the way, Paul wanted to go right. Paul wanted to go to Asia. The world would look very different. Like very, very different. I don't know if God would have, God probably would have blessed him despite his rebellion towards the Holy Spirit. I think he would have still have been used. Um, frankly, there, there might not be the religion of Islam if Paul would have went right instead of left. Interesting thought to think about. It's what I think about it late at night. <laughs> but the Holy Spirit told him to go right. When Paul and Barnabas get into a fight, there's no Holy Spirit there. So which is it? All right, let's get, let's go back to chapter 14. Before they split, this is when Barnabas and Paul are rocking and rolling. 
changing the world together, the dynamic duo. Uh, chapter 14, verse 1. Now at Iconium, they entered through, they entered together into the Jewish synagogue, and they spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles, and underline this, and poisoned their minds against their brothers. See, the enemy of God, the enemy of God wants to come into the congregation, wants to come into the midst of believers and against brothers and sisters, whether it's in a church setting or around the dining room table, whether it is in a Bible study or at the break room at your work. The devil is going to take every opportunity, every single second, to poison your mind against your brothers and sisters. Every indulgence that you take, you're binge watching Netflix for 10 hours. Maybe you're watching something that's not edifying. You need to know that every time we open up our mind to negative things, violent things, we are allowing the devil to poison our mind. And that poison, its ultimate purpose is division. So could it be? I mean, this is, this is right here. I mean, it's right here in our face. There, there was a poisoning of the mind, and then in the next chapter... Paul and Barnabas get into a fight, and they split. Again, I don't know which is which. I don't know if this is the devil having his way, or if God's like, okay, you guys need to take a break. We've got a different plan. Uh, I'm changing the the game here. You guys are going to go in separate ways. Again, we don't know if it was the devil or if it was God that split Barnabas and Paul. And you don't know if... There's certain relationships that you need to separate from because God's calling you to do it, or there's certain relationships that you need to double down on and not wimp out on, right? Okay, let's just talk about marriage. Um, So God is not going to uh, lead you to divorce your spouse unless there's infidelity and abuse. Like, you got to work it out. I'm sorry. The Holy Spirit's not going to lead you to do that. Now, you might believe your own lies, and you might be thinking to yourself, well, the Holy Spirit is, is, um, is leading me to divorce my spouse because that's how I feel. That's subjective faith, and it's wrong, and you'll get, you'll, you'll get it wrong every time. I feel like I need to change careers. I need to separate from this workplace because it's, and then you just you go ahead and list all of the, the myriad of things that you're complaining about about your workplace, all right? Um, so how can you discern? Like you're having a disagreement. Has anybody ever had a disagreement with your boss? You're having a disagreement with your boss. How do you discern if that disagreement is uh, the Lord drying up the brook so you'll move on to a better job, or if you need to suck it up and stick it out, work on yourself so that you can serve your employer? That was probably a tough thing to hear right there. How How do you know? In some cases... Frankly, we just don't know, but we do need to be a discerning group. I can tell you that your discernment will be a lot better, like discerning like which path to take, who to date, what job to take, like should I stay, should I go? Your path, will, your discernment meter will be so much better, so much sharper if you're in the pool and not in the jacuzzi. So if you're trying to discern, like, okay, do I, do I break bonds with this individual because um, I'm a Republican and they're a Democrat? Like, if, if you're trying to discern, like, 
how do I handle this relationship? And you're in the jacuzzi with your hat on and sunglasses and drinking beer and gossiping, your, your discernment will be off because you're running your mouth. But once you are in the kingdom of God, doing the very best that you can, focused on the cross of Jesus Christ, immersed in this baptismal water that is so purifying, once you choose to purify yourselves, you'll see things more clearly. But you've got to do the work. You've got to put in the time. You have to be kind. The reason why I think that Barnabas continues to be a good man because the Word of God says that he is a good man, and I believe it. Whether it was the devil or whether it was God that separated these two, again, I don't think we can prove it either way biblically, but what we do know is that, Romans 8, 28, is that God uses all things, turns all things for the good of those who love Him and that are obedient. Paul and Silas, they got stuck swimming in a lane side by side, and Paul's, his, his pace is a lot faster now. Mm-hmm. That's where the friction took place. And even if the 100% speculation, even if the devil poisoned Barnabas' mind, even if the devil poisoned Paul's mind for them to get into an argument, do you know what? God still turned it around for good. Why? It's because both men, both men were submitted to the lordship of Jesus Christ, and God can work with that. Mm -hmm. He can work with that when you're in the pool with Him together. Mm -hmm. All right. So, you have a disagreement with anybody this week? Again, you can't leave your spouse because they're not doing the dishes. That's right. That one you've got to work out. But maybe there's some other tensions. There's other, some other disagreements, and you need a discernment in your disagreement. Look, seek first the kingdom of God, right? You need to seek first the kingdom of God, and all of these things will be added unto you. Basically, what that means is you need to quit focusing on all this drama and all this tension and all this big, giant problem stuff. Like, if you're spending more time complaining about the person that you're upset with than you are in prayer, then where's the problem? All right. I've been preaching too much. Let's get the band to come on up. In, in my life in ministry, I've had um, close friends that, that have separated from me. Some of them are like, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, they need to go on mission. Yeah, that makes sense. Other times, it was pretty abundantly clear that the devil poisoned our minds. In God is way. And I know this because the other party has no fruit in their lives. Paul and Barnabas have fruit in their lives. I think one of the saddest things is when the devil poisons people's minds and then they walk away from the Lord. They lose their faith. Look, I don't have time to get into once saved, always saved type of theology. Uh, Can you lose your faith? I don't know, but I don't want to find out, and you don't want to find out either. From experience, just from pastoral experience, and again, this is, I'm not saying that thus say with the Lord, but from pastoral experience, I've seen people so dedicated to the Lord, lovers of the word and worship, and they have derailed their lives, and they've, they've abandoned God in such a way that you're just like, well, they just, they just blasphemed the Holy Spirit with their entire life. Like, we don't want to do that, do we? You don't want to do that. And so there's certain people in your life that you need to allow the Holy Spirit to discern, that you need to separate yourself from because they're tearing, your, they're tearing you down and you're not building them up. 
Sometimes we hang out with people, we think, if they hang out with me long enough, then, then I can encourage them and build them up. And maybe you can. But if they're dragging you down, it's time for separation. If they're slowing you down in your swim, if they're messing up your stroke, it's time to separate. So, hope that helps. Chapter 13, verse 36. This is Paul's very first sermon. Brothers, sons of the family of Abraham and those among you who fear God. That's us. Amen? To us has been sent the message of salvation. For those who live in Jerusalem and the rulers, because they did not recognize him, nor understand the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled by the condemning of him. And although they found in him no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they had carried out all that is written of him, they took him down from the tree, laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. And for many days he appeared to those who had come up from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to people. And we bring you the good news that God promised to the fathers that he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus, by raising him from the dead. Do you know that we serve a living God? Amen. Like we're going we're gonna to receive Holy Communion right now. So go ahead and grab your elements. I think that Paul and Barnabas' fight could have gotten a lot worse if they started calling each other names. And if they started to do some character assassinations. But these were godly men that took communion with, with the Lord probably on a daily basis. So they allowed this food and they allowed this drink to be their provision and to wash away their iniquities. As believers, as humans, um, I don't know, humans are, we're, we're kind of jacked up, right? Raise your hand if you're jacked up. We're jacked up, we're broken, and we're hurt. Sometimes we're hurt physically, sometimes we're hurt emotionally, sometimes we're hurt spiritually. And it's cliche, I know, but hurt people hurt people. And I got, a, I got a feeling that Paul and Barnabas probably hurt each other in this moment because we have no story of reconciliation afterwards. But the Spirit of God can come in and heal any hurt person and any broken person. The Holy Spirit can come in and reconcile us to our brothers and sisters who maybe we've hurt and offended, but the Holy Spirit also comes in and Jesus reconciles us to a good God. But we need to be a part of this body. What Paul and Barnabas did not do is that they did not leave the body of Christ. Don't leave the body of Christ. Everything that you need, all of your provision, all of your help, all of your support, it comes from this, the body of Christ, which is spiritual, but it's also extremely practical, and you're sitting next to it right now. Be connected to the body of Christ. Receive the body of Christ for your provision. One of the beautiful things about this drink is that it washes away all impurities. This drink will cleanse your mind from poison. You want to purify your mind of the poison? Let's do it now. Let's receive the blood of Christ for the forgiveness of our sins and the washing away of the poison of our minds. Church, I'd like to invite you to hold out your hands as um, we receive God's blessing today. Lord, 
Will you bless us and keep us and may you make your face shine upon us as we do our best to walk with the Holy Spirit this week. We thank you so much for this time that we've been in your presence. Lord, we give this week to you. In your name we pray, amen.